You're listening to Lafayette and Savoca Fantasy Football Podcast. I'm Dave Lachron. Sometimes go by Lafayette. Doesn't make sense. My last name's Lachron, but that's okay. Follow me at Lafayette underscore D on Twitter. L-O-U-G-H-Y underscore D. We'll be talking football all year long. Joined by Matt Savoca at Draftaholic. Coming back from a nice little vacation. Was refreshed until today and realized that he's back at work. What's up, brother? Yeah, that's right. I hit the pedal to the metal. We are in week one. It was a nice, refreshing Labor Day weekend away, but it's very weird, right? It felt like I should be doing something the whole time, but I also was in a wonderful place far away from the States, and I actually couldn't. And so, yeah, got to enjoy the time. Now we are one sleep away from real football, an amazing first start. First game for, to the season, this game in L.A. is going to be awesome. Bills, Rams. And then we got week one, a ton of high total games, a lot of great storylines. And that's what we're digging into today, right? With the, the biggest storylines for week one. Most of us have drafted already. How are you? How, how, have you finished all your drafts at this point? Yeah, I'm good to go. I'm good to go. And all these storylines are fantasy relevant, pertinent to what we're doing in week one. Otherwise, we wouldn't be talking about it. But You want to know about this for sure. You want to be keyed in, locked in, whether you did draft or didn't draft, doesn't matter. Uh, All of this stuff is going to be huge for you guys going into week one. And hopefully we can can settle the score for you and all the debates and arguments you'll be getting into or the tough questions and calls that you've had. We also have our start sit videos littered across the channel. If you need start sit help for week one, we got you 100% whether it's just straight receiver questions, running back, t- defenses even, across the board. We got you. It's the Castic Fantasy Football. Hey, if you're listening on a podcast for it, subscribe to the channel or the, the, the podcast, however they do it in podcasts. Uh, leave a review rating, preferably good ones, but either way helps us a ton. And if you're on YouTube, what's up? Leave a comment down below. Subscribe. Hit that thumbs up. Helps us keep the lights on if you like this type of content. Let's dive into it, man. First up. You've got San Francisco heading into Green Bay, or sorry, Chicago, and they're pretty big favorites on the road. No surprise here. You got Matt Aberflitz, you know, maybe, maybe he can bring this, he can bring this team back from the dead, but I don't think it's going to be in week one. The question is actually your question that I'm going to ask you and then answer myself. How long is the leash when it comes to Trey Lance and Jimmy G? I don't think there is a leash. It's cut, right? There is none. He has no, there is none. They signed him as a backup because getting a backup quarterback as good as Jimmy G for the price that they got him at makes absolute sense for a roster that has a top five odds to win the Super Bowl this year. This is a Super Bowl roster top to bottom that needs a backup quarterback. I'm looking at the Rams in this Thursday night game. Their QB2 is John Wolford. Are you kidding me? This is a luxury buy for a team that expects to make a deep run. I think Trey Lance is the future. And look, if he's egregious, if he cannot play football, which some high draft picks, you know, Josh Rosen comes to mind. If he just simply can't play, Garoppolo's going to give you baseline level performance, league average performance. Let the superstars do their thing at that point. We know Kittle and Samuel and Ayuk can elevate themselves in that situation. I mean, Garoppolo... He supported Debo Samuel to a wide receiver two finish last year. So there's that. I mean, sure, there was there was production out of the backfield, but still. Yeah, and I should mention, like, I don't think this is going to happen. I, I really don't. Well, I think it would be, like, something truly catastrophic. Like, uh, I think I said in one of our chats in Slack, uh, organizational malpractice to the point where you simply cannot ignore it. Sure, maybe that happens, but that's really a – one percent outcome to me i think trey lance has the full season here and they felt like this backup at this price with a couple of playing time incentives uh fine they'll do it absolutely so yeah exactly i mean you you want to talk about backups too arizona's backup is trace mcsorley now that colt mccoy's on the ir so you don't are injured reserve i are sorry had a lot i've already done a lot of shows today Matt. <laughs> but it's that time of year bud i i think san francisco is I think guys like Debo will be fine. I know you and I have slightly different opinions on that. I think he's so good after the catch. He's he's so good out of the backfield that it might not matter. I do wonder about guys like Kittle. I do wonder how, you know, this offense functions. Um, Eli Mitchell this week is an interesting one for me because he was dealing with the hammy. 
you come into a good matchup, you're touch basically touchdown favorites on the road. Is Eli Mitchell a guy that you won in your lineups this week where you drafted him? I actually have Eli Mitchell as a player on a fantasy football video coming up as a player I'd like to bench in week. Me too. One. I don't love it. You know, just looking at it from a very fundamental standpoint, they're heavy favorites in the lowest total game, we probably are able to play the starting running back. But the narratives around Kyle Shanahan and the way he uses running backs differently from year to year, the fact that we don't know how we're going to see Trey Lance be incorporated into the rushing game, and the fact that, as we said, Samuel Kittle and Ayuk are certainly good enough to just take a few touches and turn it into a hyper-efficient game themselves. The, the outs are are too plentiful for me. And Elijah Mitchell is one of those players who is a luxury flex option or second flex, but I'm okay sitting him this week. If I have um, more exciting options, especially in higher total games, I had this bot, this, this protein shake that I forgot was here. And I was like, let me drink it before it's not good. I started shaking it off the screen. And I, uh, no. said, you know what? <laughs> like I should probably commercial. shake this on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> That didn't look good. Um, We're true professionals here at Lafayette and Savoco Fantasy yeah, Football. Podcast. I strive to not be professional, to be honest with you. <laughs> Is the weather going to be that bad in Chicago, though? I saw that there were some. They were forecasting some rough weather. Is it going to be going to be that bad? Last I looked, it was something like rain and seventeen mile per hour winds. But I am looking on a certain a uh, couple sources that I look at the wind forecast has died down to the eight to 10 range and the rain forecast has died down. Yeah. It's nothing then. I, okay. At this point it's a, it's nothing. Right. But I'm saying Maybe like 10, it, 10 miles. Per, I think yeah. Alex Baker, who, you know, one of the best DFS players in the world created the bulk of tools over at stochastic for all of our DFS and fantasy I think he said once it starts getting, I think he said, what, what did he see? He see I remember naming a number that is where I'm you almost positive. It's 15, 15. Okay. So I'm like 15 positive. is where you need to start worrying or at least start adjusting. The other part is the amount of total plays with the San Francisco offense, because they rush so often in a neutral game script, they just burn the clock, rely on their defense, especially if it's a close game or they happen to be ahead. So the number of passes, first of all, if you're, if you're looking at like Brandon Ayuk, I honestly think there could only be like 26, 27 passes, maybe even less for the 49ers in a winning effort against Chicago. That's so different than a team like Arizona, who our advanced stats tool over on stochastic.com says they might pass 38 times in a game. Or Tampa Bay, who might hit 42 or 43 times in a neutral game script. 25 or 26, you need touchdowns. That's your main out. And then if you're talking about the, the Chicago side, I, I'm fading Darnell Mooney. I'm fading David Montgomery. You probably have to play him as an RB2, but uh, I, I can't even talk about Chicago, man. They're just, in my opinion, they're, them and the Giants are still in the jokes of franchise tier for me. Prove me wrong. Also happening in the uh, NFC West is little little return home for Russell Wilson. Week one, newly minted quarterback just signed a, a big extension. You got Russell Wilson. It was, it was it an extension? He did, didn't he? Didn't he sign a contract yeah, yeah. and then an extension? Yeah. Got a huge, huge boost in pay. Huge extension. You got him returning to Seattle against just a, a beleaguered Seahawks team, a shell of their former selves. I mean, I think there's a lot of different ways you can look at this game. You know, is he is he motivated against this former team? Is he this? Is he that? And then I think there's the way of looking at it to say he's facing the Seattle Seahawks and he has an embarrassment of riches at his disposal as far as pass catching weapons go and running backs. This is easy. Play Russell Wilson if you got him. I think he was in that sweet spot, that perfect zone, especially in one QB league where you have a little bit of QB1 overall upside on a week-to-week -week basis, especially if you're playing a mediocre team like the Seattle Seahawks in 2022, and you didn't have to spend huge draft capital. And we're already looking at him as a potential top 10 option this week. The big thing I want to see with Russell Wilson is that deep ball accuracy, because he is typically, 
as you've mentioned on a previous episode of Lafayette and Savoca, he one of the best deep ball passers in the league when healthy. Got hurt last year, got hit on the hand, and he came back, but he just wasn't the same deep passer. It also coincided with huge efficiency from the rushing game, from Rashad Penny, and so they didn't need the deep passes like they usually do. Still, he ended up number five in the NFL in total passes, over 20 air yards, 5.5 per game, and he still was just 13th in fantasy points per game. Now you add Cortland Sutton, Jerry Judy, and I think he's going to throw the ball, dump off out of the backfield plenty to Javante Williams and Melvin Gordon. First of all, they stomped the Seahawks, and Russell Wilson is a easy, easy uh, start for any team unless you have maybe like one of the top three options and then what are you doing unless it's a super flex league having those two the revenge game narrative is nonsense to me in the say here's what i mean it's just a really good matchup and a quarterback that went healthy has proven to be elite with Corlin sutton and jerry judy and, and javante williams and, and melvin gordon that's all i need to know okay the thing with the problem with the, uh, the narrative for the revenge game is you could say, all right, yeah, he's fired up. He's going to kill him. Or you could say his nerves got to him. Oh, his nerves got to him. He struggled because he was back in Seattle uh, under the wrath of the 12th man. I don't know which one it's going to be. I don't know. How, how the hell am I supposed to know? I don't. I have zero idea. So uh, I'll take it on paper and I'll say that Russell Wilson is in a great spot uh, and I want all of the Cortland Sutton, for sure. And I like Judy. I love Sutton. I like Judy. Mm -hmm. I love Sutton because I think that he is going to end up being Russell Wilson's top target, but that's just my opinion. That's what I think. And reports out of camp recently would suggest right now that's the way yes. it's trending. But if you're talking deep ball too, I mean, Sutton finally has someone tossing him the rock that can get it to him. I think you could see some huge games out of him this year. I wouldn't be surprised if it starts in week one. On the other side, though, is there anyone you want to play, like Metcalf or Lockett? Do you say, you know what, Penny could definitely have a big game based on volume alone, or does that offensive line worry you in this matchup? I mean, that's a tough spot for the Seahawks team. Big, big home favorite, or dogs. Yeah, look, they're probably going to end up passing because they're probably going to end up being in a non-neutral game script, and that means they're playing from behind when – Teams play from behind. They pass a whole lot more than they would in neutral situations. That makes sense to everyone. I don't see Seattle being effective in the passing game this year. I kind of hope I'm wrong about Geno Smith, but I think that Seahawks fans have been completely spoiled by just even the baseline play of Russell Wilson. Forget the, the ceiling games because they've been truly spectacular over the years. It could be really, really bad. And I'd like to think that Tyler Lockett and DK Metcalf are good enough, even at the, their separate points in their careers, that they can help elevate a quarterback. But it usually doesn't work that way, unfortunately. If you have a below average quarterback and efficiency and accuracy as Geno Smith was in his starts last year, it's really hard to overcome that. Could you have spike weeks here and there? Fine. But you know what? I think you've also said this before. Last year, there was a similar situation in Houston. We knew they were going to be terrible, but we had one clear wide receiver one. This year, it's even worse. Bad quarterback, poor game situations, and there's two of them, meaning they possibly trade off their games, making it impossible to figure out who to start unless you're playing best ball or something like that. Yeah, that's, that's the problem. Even last year, even last year, it was tough to figure out who to start, and they had Russell Wilson. You know, like well, you'd... at least you had like 40 point upside, right? Well, like of course. Like those Tyler Lockett uh, well, games. I, I, you know, sometimes I get in like the DFS mentality where you never know which good one it's going to be. But yeah, Tyler Lockett was one of those guys where he would disappear or he'd give you, you know, a two or three touchdown game. Those three touchdown games are, are, are in the rear view now. They're long gone. At least it appears that way. I will say though, with Rashad Penny, I still. Have, Let's say, you know, you drafted Alan Lazard and like the, depending on where you're drafting, you could definitely get better value on him in certain leagues, depending on who you're drafting with. Let's say you got him in the, in the seventh or the eighth or something. And, and he's your flex or you drafted like, you know, quarterback tight end relatively early. And, and you're going to flex in one of these guys that that's questionable or might not play in week one. 
I still think Rashad Penny is perfectly fine to flex in there because it looks like Kem Walker's trending towards doubtful. And if that's the case, now you're talking about a Seattle Seahawks team who in that backfield behind Rashad Penny is going to be either saying, all right, let's just keep Penny on the field. Mind you, they just gave him like a, what, $6 million one-year contract. So I would assume that they'll use him. Talking about like Travis Homer and DJ Dallas. Rashad Benny's still the best back on that team when healthy by a wide, an astronomical margin. So if you assume and say Ken Walker's out, that that Penny is going to get the large majority of snaps and subsequent touches in this backfield, you know, they don't need to score 30 points in order for him to be a perfectly viable flex. It's true. I think he is almost the very end of the comfortable flex tier. We were going back and forth when we were uh, separating the running backs into tiers. And by the way, guys, we're going live at 10 a.m. every single weekday, breaking down each of the fantasy positions. And then on Fridays, answering all of your questions heading into the weekend with my buddy, Nick Lepre, notorious FNTSY over on Twitter. And we were going back and forth about Penny because a lot of people are in situations where they're looking at Chase Edmonds or Rashad Penny or AJ Dillon and Rashad Penny, and Melvin Gordon, and Rashad Penny. And we often found ourselves on the opposite side of Rashad Penny, though we like him this year. The Denver defense is stout, to say the least, in schedule-adjusted fantasy points allowed, which is basically the fantasy points allowed above or below an opponent's average. Denver was third best in the NFL, hardest for opposing offenses, up there with Buffalo, New England, New Orleans, and they were strong against the running back, specifically top 10 in the NFL. So Penny, all of the opportunity in the world. He truly has, the sky's the limit, and he's a great ceiling pick for that reason at his average draft position this draft season. But I still have him kind of below players like Eli Mitchell, Josh Jacobs even. I have Damian Pierce certainly above him, Kareem Hunt, and then I have Rashad Penny. You might be in a position where you have to start him, but I don't love it this week. Okay. Fair enough. I get it. I like him a little more than you do. If Ken Walker's out, I'll basically just take the volume. That That's the way I see it. Travis Homer and DJ Dallas are not taking no. significant touches. Yeah, I mean, right. they are. What? it's possible that Rex Burkhead takes all the third down work from Damian Pierce and they're eight point dogs at home, right? So where's the where's the big difference there? There is absolutely not a big difference there. In fact, I have them just two running backs apart in my current rankings. Might tweak it before we get to Sunday. Damian Pierce firmly in that end of the running back three tier. Depending on your league size, you might have to start a running back in that spot. Right, exactly, yeah. But it's certainly far from, I cannot wait to play Damian Pierce in his first game as a touchdown underdog when I'm pretty sure Jonathan Taylor is just going to run it down their throats for four quarters. How about Baker Mayfield hosting uh, the Cleveland Browns? Now, they didn't exactly end on the greatest of terms. They went out, got Deshaun Watson. Baker said, I'm out. I'm out. It's not happening anymore. And now they uh, play home to the Cleveland Browns this week who won't have Deshaun Watson. They'll be running out Jacoby Brissett. This, the Cleveland Browns secondary is still very good, though. Like Their pass rush is still good. See, revenge or not, not the best matchup for one Baker Mayfield in week one. I think there's a possibility it goes well for him, but I think the floor here is so low that unless you're talking about a two quarterback league, you're not starting Baker Mayfield in week one. You're just not doing it. Miles Garrett and crew get to him. It's going to be a real problem. Even if you have DJ Moore, Robbie Anderson, Christian McCaffrey, and uh, yes, LaVishka Chanel. Now, in that same schedule-adjusted fantasy points allowed stat, the Cleveland Browns were seventh best in the NFL. This is a tough, tough defense, and I think one where you actually keep it pretty slow-paced. I kind of hope I'm wrong here, especially from the Carolina side, but Baker Mayfield is probably a last gasp QB2 in a super flex league. I hope this game is fun. I kind of think this is a fantasy dud, except for maybe Nick Chubb. Yeah. I mean, McCaffrey, obviously, you just, just, yeah, sure. Just go, I know, I know what you mean, but some people will say, well, what about me? Of course, you play Christian McCaffrey in a spot like this. But I mean, given where you draft DJ Moore, are you, 
are you are, who would who would you play over DJ Moore? Would you is he is this a spot where you go? I think DJ Moore needs to be needs to be in lineups just because of where you drafted him, or no? It's a tough spot. Moore is good enough here. I think Moore is in the wide receiver two tier every single week because I do think the touchdown upside is there with Mayfield in a way it wasn't. Robbie Anderson has been a thousand yard receiver in the league, but ultimately this is Moore's clear team. And if you're talking about who is this year's Brandon Cooks on a mediocre to bad team, but just gets peppered with targets, Amari Cooper is a very popular choice throughout the fantasy industry. And I know Christian McCaffrey will certain get, certainly get his targets, but why not 10 targets, 11 targets, t- closer to 12 targets a game for DJ Moore in a slightly more up-tempo offense in Carolina? Something I want to hit on real quick. Uh, and, hey, hit the thumbs up, subscribe if you're here on YouTube. Again, rating, review, podcast, all that good stuff. Uh, I'll stop annoying you if you do it. That's not true. Not really revenge factor here. Nothing. Uh, it is what it is, but... In the same vein, Joe Flacco, we, he will be starting. The, the soonest Zach Wilson will be available, according to Robert Sala, is week four. So it's Joe Flacco time for the first probably month of the season. And he gets uh, the Baltimore Ravens. Yeah, they're home. But, I mean, listen, this is just my take. I, I think the Ravens, there are seven-point favorites, but – like if I'm betting this game, I'm laying the seven on the Ravens. I think they smack this Jets team around in week one. I do too. I think J.K. Dobbins is going to play. I think Lamar, Lamar Jackson is going to play really well. I think we're going to see a secondary receiver, maybe even a tertiary receiver from the Ravens break out as well over the first few weeks. And why not the Jets, who are one of the worst defenses in that schedule adjusted fantasy points allowed stat? This isn't going to be pretty. And one of the only saving graces we might have is that the Ravens get up by a ton early and it forces the Jets and Flacco into a dump off pass only situation, which makes Elijah Moore and maybe even Garrett Wilson, maybe Michael Carter, a little bit more fantasy viable than they would be in a neutral game script because they're just forced to play up tempo and pass happy. Uh, This Jets team, I actually think will have some fantasy relevant players, but good luck figuring it out heading into week one. And if Roddy Stanley suits up and plays for Baltimore, even more reason to like the Baltimore Ravens here. A guy hasn't practiced or played since October of, of last year. So it's, I think it's a long shot, but he is back at practice now. And, you know, that's like, that's Lamar Jackson's guardian angel right there. So yeah. woo, <laughs> could make a big difference, could make a big difference once again. Yeah, I think that, and by the way, are you familiar with John Harbaugh, Harbaugh's recent week one record? Oh, no, I'm not. Not off the top of my head. All right. So, you know how he is with like preseason and all that crazy stuff. But if you were to, last year, they lost to the Raiders in overtime. But the games that he's won back, dating back, because 2015, they hadn't lost the week one game until last year 59 to 10. 38 to 6, 20 nothing, 47 to 3. Those are some of the week one wins you're getting out of John Harbaugh. So uh they come upward. prepared, is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. And and sure, maybe the Jets uh, have an upward trajectory here, but uh I yeah, I, I think Baltimore goes in and and blows their doors off. But I was looking at some PFF analysis where they were looking at range of outcomes on a per play basis for each of the quarterbacks in the AFC North. And you know Lamar Jackson's ceiling is like way higher than Joe Burrows. And now I believe it. what actually happens is, you know, who knows, right? It, there was a, a great ceiling season that just occurred for Joe Burrow and company in Cincinnati, but why not the Baltimore Ravens? The bet that I'm making that maybe you shouldn't, that dark horse Super Bowl team is the Baltimore Ravens. You can get them at plus 2000 at some books to win the Super Bowl. That's a crazy off the wall bet that I actually really like. I can appreciate it. Good defense, strong secondary, good enough pass rush, good offense. I like it. 
Hey guys, if you haven't checked out Underdog Fantasy, what are you waiting for? Truly, best ball is the best way to play fantasy football. We love our leagues, those home leagues that have been long running, but best ball, you just draft your team and win huge prizes. No waiver wires, no trades, no hanging out by your phone, so you got to get there the second you know, a player is dropped on the waiver wire, none of that. And they've got awesome tournaments as well. The Best Ball Mania 3 tournament has a $10 million prize pool, and it's about to fill up, so you better use promo code STOCASTIC, S-T-O-K-A-S-T-I-C, to get a first match deposit bonus up to $100. Simple as that. You can enter that Best Ball Mania 3 tournament. They've got other prize entries as well, and it doesn't stop when the season starts. They've got weekly drafts as well. Truly so much to offer over there at Underdog Fantasy. Make sure to use promo code STOCASTIC. That's S. S-T-O-K-A-S-T-I-C. Where do you stand on Bateman coming into to this week specifically? The year, whatever, we've talked a lot about that, but no more Marquise Brown. Mark Andrews is a stud, I and mean, we saw last year just absolute animal at tight end. But aside from that, you're talking about guys like Devin Duvernay behind, behind somebody like Rashad Bateman on a run-first team, of course. You said it, run-first team. Absolutely. And they're playing the Jets. They're going to be able to do what they want in this game environment. They're going to be able to run the ball. I actually think J.K. Dobbins is a sneaky good flex play, despite what they're saying about him limping in practice. No, he's not limping. But Rashad Bateman actually comes out in the stochastic first run of projections. 23rd overall in half PPR projections. Not bad at all. The Jets defense, one of the worst pass defenses in the NFL last year. We can say whatever we want about an upward trajectory as a franchise, maybe. But I still think Lamar Jackson and company do whatever they want. I think the tertiary option that we got to look out for, though, is Isaiah Likely. You don't see tight ends pop off like this as rookies right away. Usually they're very good. At some point, maybe they're not fantasy relevant like week one, but don't be surprised if it's early on for Isaiah likely. All right. Well, speaking of limping at practice, you have some teams that are dealing with some considerable pieces of, of, of news when it comes to injury, or really we're waiting on news. I mean, we already hit on someone like Ken Walker. If he's out yet, yeah, personally, I do think, you know, Penny makes for a solid flex, but you're talking about receivers. Green Bay, man, you've got Alan Lazard, who is questionable. If he doesn't play, you're looking at Romeo Dobbs. You're looking at Sammy Watkins. You're talking about you know, Randall Cobb. And then Robert Tunyon, who knows if he plays either. A lot of question marks there. This could turn into one of those games where Aaron Jones and A.J. Dillon just see a Herculean amount of work going into week one against the Minnesota uh, Vikings. So spoiler alert about a video I've got coming out, a start sit video to help you out for week one. I think the Minnesota Vikings are going to be the team that pushes the tempo and passing. And if the Vikings are successful in what is supposed to be a new look, passing minded offense in Minnesota, it will force Aaron Rodgers and company into a slightly more pass heavy game script than they want to right now. I fully agree with you. I think what they want to do is just get A.J. Dillon and Aaron Jones as many touches as possible, no matter what that means. Dump-offs, little swing passes, handing it off, whatever they can do to get their best two playmakers the ball, they're going to try to do. But if Minnesota gets up or they get a few touchdowns, Justin Jefferson gets a big play, Thielen catches a touchdown, which he's want to do, you could see the Packers being forced to pass. Right now, the stochastic projections really don't have an inkling about any wide receiver right now. In fact, I was thinking Watkins might get a boost, and maybe by Sunday he does. We got him outside the top 80 wide receivers in our first run of projections. I have a feeling it will get a little higher than that, especially if Lazard continues to miss practice. But what a mess with these wideouts in Green Bay. Hey, tell you what, Kevin O'Connell's Vikings are going to get thrown right into the fire in week one because this is not an easy matchup for them at all. You know, you're talking about a Packers deep secondary that or coverage grade, according to PFF, that was eighth best last year. And Jair Alexander missed most of the season. So now that he's back, they're scary good. They're, this could be one of those very interesting games where the running backs are involved both a lot as in the, on the ground, but also uh, in the passing game. But if Lazard is out, if you're in a 14-team league, do you consider someone like Romeo Dobbs? 
Yeah, gosh, you might have to, especially if it's one of these three wide receiver or multi flex leagues. Guys, this is this is slim pickings here, though. We're talking about day three rookies in Green Bay. You know, Makajeski, an analyst who unbelievable at college. NFL DFS, but also helps out on the fantasy football side during the off season, season was saying that this is an organization that doesn't care at all about draft capital and just flat out won't play day three players, even though they're on the roster sometimes for years. Romeo Dabbs has had a lot of positive press, but I think we're ahead of our skis saying week one against Minnesota, we have to play them. I still actually think Watkins is underrated in a median projection sense. The ceiling is there. Yeah, maybe Watkins is the guy. I don't think it's going to be Watson, though. Not in week one. Not yet. I don't think so. It's I don't think so either. Practiced. Mm-hmm. Arizona's got a couple question marks. It looks like Rondell Moore will be able to play. He returned to practice. It, it appears that he, he should be on the field. But no DeAndre Hopkins. This team is really, really intriguing because you're going up in a game against Kansas City that has the highest total on the slate at 53 and a half last I looked. Um, Zach Ertz is also day-to-day. You're now staring down the barrel of a situation that could open up a massive target share for for Marquise Brown. And I don't know. This is probably more DFS-related, right? But does A.J. Green see an expanded role if you're down? Obviously, he plays, you know, a different position. He's going to line up differently than a guy like Rondell Moore, but what do you do if Moore and Ertz are both out against a high-powered Kansas City Chiefs team that's going to put points on the board? Because Arizona's secondary is not going to be good this year. Right, that shootout is coming. You know, Patrick Mahomes and maybe Clyde Edwards-Hilaire, but that Kansas City Chiefs offense is getting theirs. I would be shocked if they put the lid on the Chiefs. So someone in Arizona has to step up. I said there's an eight-target floor for Marquise Brown in this game. And I think Rondell Moore is second in line, especially with Zach Ertz seemingly more hurt than Moore. But you're right. We got A.J. Green just inside the top 50 wide receivers in the clear wide receiver 4-5 range, which in many leagues, especially beyond 12 teams or if you start many wide receivers, is clearly in the starter category right near players like Chase Claypool, Kenny Galladay, players who are Big play, touchdown guys, but not necessarily volume guys. Would it surprise you if something like three catches, one touchdown, 38 yards for A.J. Green? That's not a terrible play as your final flex in a a fantasy league. Not at all. He gets red zone targets, too. Mm -hmm. It's it's not the craziest idea. Obviously, we have to wait and see what's going on with it with, uh, with Zach Ertz, who's going to, you know, his target share should be decent enough. Rondell Moore. No DeAndre Hopkins. That's one where, you know, if you have to make some decisions, you might be waiting up until Sunday for sure. Unfortunately, that is a a 425 game. So you might have to, you might be forced to play some one o'clock guys if we don't have any word until after those games kick off. It sucks. Maybe you will have news. Tough to say though. What about- good PSA, sorry to cut you off there. Good PSA, always put your late game- players in the flex spots so yep. you give yourself the most flexibility never leave them in the single positional spots if you can make it make 100%. that happen that's a pro- you'll kick yourself you'll kick yourself when that happens and you realize what you've done do you think chris godwin plays i do shed that brace they kind of need him right uh, russell gage hasn't been on the field for a couple weeks it looks like he is going to play julio jones looks good now what does he look like five weeks from now? They need Chris Godwin in this offense. Uh, this team is stacked for a wide receiver perspective, and they believe that their depth players are way better than many other teams' starters. But still, Tom Brady coming back for this final year. They absolutely need Chris Godwin. I think there's like an eight to nine target floor in this up-tempo game against Dallas. Godwin said he's not sure if he's going to play, but he said, I imagine I have the final say on that. It's going to come down the field because I understand what I'm capable of doing on the field when healthy, but I also understand what I'm capable of pushing through. Oof. I don't know. I think you're probably right that he played. I think it's a little gamesmanship. I hope I maybe it's too wishful thinking because I want, I love Chris Godwin as a player. I, I want him to be healthy this year in what is supposed to be an explosive offense. Do you play him in week one if he's active? Do you worry about restrictions, snap count limits? 
Yeah. Yeah, I do. Especially where I drafted him kind of mid, what, seventh, sixth round sometimes. I'm ready to roll. If he's ready to roll, I am too. All right. And uh, when it comes to the Dallas Cowboys, Jason Peters, 40 years old. As a as a, a lifelong Eagles fan, that one was was odd to say the least. You know him going him going to the Cowboys, but I get it. Get paid, man. Do what you got to do. Do you think there's real questionable, significant questionables with these Dallas pass catchers for Week One? Yeah, I do because I don't think they would be rushing Michael Gallup back. And and I do kind of put my own spin on that to say that he's rushing back. Jerry Jones had some quote where he said that if it were the Super Bowl, Gallup would be out there kind of indicating that they're going to take it slow, but he's close to returning. I think that also means they need him on the field because they realize their number two receiver right now is either Dalton Schultz or a mid-day three pick in Jalen Tolbert. Uh, or excuse me, a, a day two pick. But Jalen Tolbert is a mediocre prospect that is overperforming his draft expectations so far. Sometimes those are big flameouts in year one. Uh, this is hard to bet on for me. This isn't some like first round or mid first round prospect they're betting on as a secondary receiver outside CD Lamb. It's a lot to ask. And with Gallup, Schultz, and Lamb all healthy, that's a totally different equation. That's a good team right there. All right. Rapid fire for all of the offenses that have had a makeover, so to speak, from the previous season. Which ones of these guys? Are you confident running out there in 12-team leagues, right? Let's go with Philly first. You've got A.J. Brown, Devontae Smith, Dallas Goddard. Miles Sanders is back at practice, but who knows what the backfield looks like, especially considering he's been sidelined for a couple of weeks before returning. What do you do with the Philadelphia Eagles in week one? Start, A.J., start Miles if he plays, and I think I'm playing Devonta Smith too. Goddard, okay. the, where you drafted him, he is your clear tight end one, most likely, right? In that t tight end seven, tight end yeah, eight be. range. You, you, you just start him. That's why you picked him. But Miles Sanders is the one where if he's in, I think I'm going to go for it. You've been banging the drum for him all off season. Finally healthy, hopefully. Uh, the one that I'm questionable about, but against a Detroit defense that was very subpar against the pass. I'll play Devonta Smith. I think this up-tempo offense starts for Philadelphia right from week one. It's a fantastic matchup. It's mm -hmm. a very good matchup. I'm surprised they're only three and a half, four point favorites, but you know, that's how it goes. Miami Dolphins, Jalen Waddle looks like he'll be back. They just they traded for Tyree Kill. And then in the backfield, to me, I think I, uh, I'm less convinced about this than others. Like Chase Edmonds, I'm just not convinced is going to be good. Uh, I just, I can't get there. And maybe I'll be wrong. I'm fine with that. I'm very underexposed to him in any fantasy or best ball league, so I wouldn't love it, to be honest with you. But this is a team that looks a whole lot different than they did last year as well. So Chase Edmonds, when you look at the projections, he's ahead of players like Damian Pierce, ahead of players like Josh Jacobs, ahead of players like Rashad Penny. But it doesn't feel good, does it? <laughs> like it, it doesn't feel right. The New England defense was a top three team in schedule-adjusted fantasy points allowed. They are favored. They got a solid 25 and a half team total in Vegas right now. And yet that's the one that really scares me. Waddle, Tyree Kill, all systems go. And I think Cedric Wilson out of the slot is going to have a bigger role than anyone expects. Again, in a likely up-tempo offense. I'm not sure what this running back position. I like Chase Ed Edmonds, the player, but I think Mostert, when healthy, gets plenty of run. All right, the Raiders. Here's another one. I told you we're going rapid fire. We're going to keep this moving. So you're going up against uh, a, a team that, that has a really, really good secondary in the Chargers. Now, is J.C. Jackson – hold on a second. I don't think he's playing. He's doubtful, right? Yep, I don't yeah. think he's playing. So that is huge. Okay. And, and I forgot about that earlier. But J.C. Jackson being doubtful for this game, woof. Makes a very big difference. You still have, you know, Derwin James at, at safety. Um, there's a lot of very good players on this team. On the line, no question. There's a lot to like here. What do you make, though, of the Raiders going into this one with Darren Waller now, Hunter Renfro, and the newly minted Devontae Adams? We talk about the backfield, too, because Josh Jacobs, you want to talk about not feeling good. Josh Jacobs never feels good. Yeah, don't feel good about Jacobs at all. 
you may not have a situation where you ha where you can bench him this week, but that's the one where if I could keep him on my bench, I would. You got to play Waller. You got to play Renfro. You got to play Devontae Adams, of course. And on the other side of the ball, because there is a likely shootout in play here, a 28-point implied total for the Kansas, or excuse me for this uh, Los Angeles Chargers. Got to play Eckler. You got to play Keenan Allen. Mike Williams is a must start for me. And here's my sneaky start: Gerald Everett. Justin Herbert likes to throw to the tight end position. I think there are going to be plenty of weeks where Everett slides in as that number four receiving option behind Allen, Williams, and Eckler. Why not week one? Why not against a Las Vegas team that is only league average in defense against the tight end? Yeah, okay. Sorry, I, I, I had to rapid fire. So I was like, yes to all the obvious, no to Josh Jacobs. I'm look at you. Gerald Everett. <laughs> I, I get it. I get it for sure. And I do think, of course, that this could be one of those spots where where Darren Waller kind of just surprises everybody. Uh, you know, because it, he was out for a while, but it sounds like a lot of that was contract dispute type stuff. And, and I think so too. And, yeah, and less the hamstring injury than anything else. So I'm not particularly worried about that. We already talked about Carolina as kind of a new look team. The last one and a big one. Probably a lot of people watching this have questions about it too. The New Orleans Saints. Alvin Kamara is back, um, but you've got – or not back, sorry. He's good right now. It doesn't mm -hmm. look like he's going to face any legal consequences, at least not in the foreseeable future. Michael Thomas is back. Chris Olave is a pretty early first-round pick, and they brought on Jarvis Landry. And Jameis Winston's back. Way different team than, than last year. Not even, not even identifiable from 2021. So much better than Deontay Hardy and Traquan Smith and Marquez Callaway. Absolutely. And I do think they're one or two Tampa Bay unexpected injuries away from playing themselves into playoff contention and maybe even further because this NFC South isn't strong outside of the Buccaneers and the Buccaneers are really old, especially offensively. They're injury prone just by the nature of their advanced average age. And just look at the specific players we're talking about. We already mentioned Godwin. Evans is a soft tissue injury concern all the time. Same with Julio Jones. And Gage is already dealing with that right now. So there is some risk of ruin for that Tampa Bay Buccaneers offense. And if that occurs, then the Saints can slide right in, man. Michael Thomas looks like himself, apparently. Jarvis Landry has been a Pro Bowl player. And Olave, like you said, could kind of be that missing piece. Maybe he ends up with sort of six to seven targets a game, but he's getting two or three red zone looks, making him viable in a likely shootout heavy NFC South. All right, we've reached the end of the road, but first, for anybody out there that's dealing with some injuries, dealing with some questions, two sneaky starts, two players that you see as, what do we get, what are you saying? Outside the top 24 at mm -hmm. their respective position or... Matt, outside of tw top 24 at their respective position. Yep. Okay. Or or if it were talking like quarterbacks, we would say like outside the top 12, right? Okay, sure, sure. And tight end? Yeah, exactly, for the onesie positions. I'll start at running back. Clyde Edwards-Hilaire. I got him right inside the top 15 running backs this week. It's because of the high implied total in Kansas City. And obviously, they like to pass. They love to pass. But Clyde Edwards-Hilaire, after his first healthy offseason in the NFL, and he had his gallbladder out. He was 165 pounds last year. He's literally a completely different player this year. And as much hype as Isaiah Pacheco and a little bit of Jarek McKinnon have had over the, the course of the preseason, I think Edwards-Hilaire is the clear lead back in an up-tempo shootout game against Arizona. And then the quarterback I really like, Tua Tagovailoa. I mentioned how much I like the Miami offense, especially in the passing game. I think Tua Tagovailoa in a make-or-break year starts off a new superstar ascendance question mark in Week wow. One against the Patriots. I think he's. I, I think it could be on for both Hurts and Tagovailoa. I think. So you're I think buying in, man. I just. I don't know. Maybe I'm. Just too pumped for football. Just seeing them, Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddle look like best it. friends out there, and they're dancing all around. And there are a couple highlights here and there. There's enough hype. Maybe there. Maybe it is a, a little fire where there's smoke. I get it. I get it. Now, I'm gonna go. We're talking uh, outside of top 24 rank for this week or ADP. Uh, I would go and rank for this week, but right. you know, just out outside the obvious. Okay. 
Uh, I've been getting a lot of questions about this player, so maybe I'm maybe I'm wrong here, but he was outside the top 24 at his position in ADP, and still I'm getting a ton of questions about whether or not he's startable, so I'll mention him. Well, first up, actually, Marquez Valdez-Scantling. If you need somebody, uh, he's on an elite offense. They have the 29-point implied total of the week. It's the highest of any team going in week one. Uh, can he rip off a long touchdown or two? Absolutely. Does he have arguably the best quarterback out there? Yes. So if you, that's easy enough. Antonio Gibson, tons of questions on Gibson. Not as much of a sleeper as you might think, but based on a lot of the questions I've gotten, it's worth talking about. He, last year, was a lot better than people probably suspect, right? There's this notion that he wasn't good at all. And a lot of that, in my opinion, is because he had so many weeks where he disappeared. If you actually look at Antonio Gibson, 1,300 yards from scrimmage, 10 touchdowns, finished as the RB10 and had the fourth most carries in the league. Brian Robinson's not going to play. So if you need a flex, because Antonio Gibson, even after the Brian Robinson news, was still going late. I still got him in an underdog draft very late, just yesterday. If you need a guy that, you, that could get 20-plus carries as a home favorite, Antonio Gibson makes a lot of sense this week against the Jaguars. Yojo, you only Jaguars once at home if you're Washington. You're not going to be a home favorite against one of the bottom five teams in the league defensively very often. Gibson, terrible circumstances, why he's thrust back into the number one role, but bottom line, he is. Last six weeks of his 2021 season, he was actually running back five and expected fantasy points per game. So the opportunity was there, probably going to be there again. I think that's a really good call. Hey, you can follow Mac, ask him questions, whatever you got to do at Draftaholic on Twitter, me at Lafayette underscore D, L-O-U-G-H-Y underscore D. Check out the podcast channels if you haven't done so yet. Leave a like, a review, subscribe, all that good stuff. And, uh, well, let's watch some football. We'll see you back here for week two. Peace.